Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, we've had a lovely weekend here at the house. Got a little bit of snow, spent some time with family, and tonight I wanna go ahead and just make a quick video for you, just to have a little chat with you about a video I saw online the other day. So, let's cue up the music and have a look at Brian's logic and the one-way speed of light. Now let's have a look at Brian's video, The End of the Globe Earth Model, and see how he crafts his argument. And we'll have a look at it from the characteristics of science denial. So, take it away, Brian. The origins and end of the Globe Earth Model, non-parallel sun rays. <clears throat> contrary, contrary to popular belief, the one-way speed of light was never actually measured. Nobody in the history of the world has ever measured the one-way speed of light, and possibly nobody ever will. Why this is important in a video about non-parallel sun rays is because it is officially claimed that sun rays are parallel and the reason that they claim this is due to a belief that the sun is a very big and very far uh, and very far away a claim distance of 93 million statute mi <coughs> miles or one astronomical unit as the AU is defined as the exact distance between the globe earth and heliocentric sun the sun is claimed to be 8.03 light minutes away from us and they determined this via a claimed two-way speed of light measurement. But there was never a two-way speed of light measurement made as log logically there can't be if there is no one-way speed of light measurement. Okay, so let's look at this from a conspiratorial thinking aspect. Now, much of the conspiratorial thinkers out there use something called the tobacco script. The tobacco script was developed in the 1950s when the tobacco companies hired a public relations firm to help them deal with reports coming out in Reader's Digest and medical journals suggesting that cigarette smoking was associated with lung cancer. Now, the main thrust of the tobacco script is deny the evidence. Say that the evidence isn't all in. There are other scientists that say other things. This is what Brian's using to try and put doubt on the globe. He's not making an argument for the flat earth. He's arguing against the globe. Now, it's true that we can't measure the one-way speed of light, and there's a number of reasons for that. However, his assertion that since we can't measure the one-way speed of light, it's impossible to measure the two-way speed of light is ludicrous. We've done that on a number of occasions. It's very easy to say, well, I send a, I send a radar beam out, the radar beam comes back. The amount of time that that takes to go out and come back is related to the speed of light and the two-way trip. From my, from my transmitter to the object back to my receiver. That's very easy to do. So for example, when an amateur ham operator does an earth moon earth bounce, which is a very common thing for them to do, he will transmit a signal in the direction of the moon and he will listen for the echo to come back. And it takes about two and a half seconds. Now whether it took two seconds to get there and half a second to come back or one and a quarter seconds each way is immaterial. The delay between his transmission and when he receives it is still two and a half seconds. So, whether or not we decide that we're going to have a consistent speed of light by convention, or we're going to try and do the math and come up with a reason that it would be different somehow going out versus coming back and complicate things is immaterial. Now, what exactly is a convention? Now, by convention, this is a yardstick. We can also measure this with the metric system and come up with whatever it is, 0.9 meters. But the bottom line is whether we measure it using imperial units or using metric units is immaterial. We can pick one of them for one reason or the other. It doesn't mean that the other one's wrong. The bottom line is this yardstick is still 36 inches long or 0.9 meters. What convention we use to describe the length of this does not change the actual length of the physical object. But since he mentioned the speed of light, let's go ahead and have a quick look at how that was originally determined. Now the first scientific determination of the speed of light was by a Dutch astronomer by the name of Romer working for the Paris Observatory. 
and he used one of the moons of Jupiter called Io. Now the interesting thing about Io is that Io had a very well described orbit around Jupiter that was in the same ecliptic plane as Jupiter's orbit around the Sun. Now what that meant was that every single orbit Io would pass through the shadow of Jupiter. And as it came out of the shadow of Jupiter, it became visible. Now when the Earth was in its orbit at point L, we could time the cycle time between when Io emerged from the shadow of Jupiter to where it came around and emerged again, and it would be something like 42 and a half hours. Then as time went on and the Earth was down by point K, we could also measure the same thing, and we found that it was 42 and a half hours plus X. Now the fact that it took a little bit longer for us to see Jupiter's moon Io appear when we were at point K further away from Jupiter was explained by the concept that light had to travel farther from point L to point K. And that X, that extra amount of time, was the time it took light to travel that distance. Now the interesting thing about it is we could tell what that distance was. So even though we didn't have a very accurate determination of one astronomical distance, the distance from the Earth to the Sun at that time, we knew that it was one astronomical unit. We also knew that Jupiter was ten and a half astronomical units from the Sun. We could then measure the angle formed by the lines the Earth to the Sun and Jupiter to the Sun, and we could determine the angle between those two lines. So we had a side, angle, side, triangle. Using the law of cosines, we could find the distance between Io and the Earth at points L and K. Needless to say, we could then find the distance between points L and K. We then looked at the time it took that light to go from point L to K, and we were able to use that to come up with a velocity of light. Now, that velocity was very accurate. It was verified in 1726 with stellar parallax. It's verified by ham radio operators doing Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth bounces. And it's been verified by a number of other means. However, currently, by convention, we state that the speed of light is C. And C has a very specific value. Just like we can decide by convention to use metric or imperial measurements, we simply use a convention to define the speed of light. Now, what does that matter? Really nothing, because what Brian didn't mention is it doesn't matter if it's longer or shorter going out and coming back, it still takes a total of two and a half seconds. GPS satellites, for example, have to make relativistic corrections in order to be accurate. Now, whether the speed of light to the GPS satellite and back is consistent or varies whether it's coming or going is immaterial. It does not change the end result. And as a result, it's an untestable difference. In other words, it's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light, but it doesn't matter. So let's continue on with Brian. So what actually is the two-way speed of light claim all about? <clears throat> well, for a start, it's not a measurement, but only a calculation that is solely ba based on a belief when in actuality it is based on four pre-assumptions and two averages. To explain, <clears throat> I'm going to read down through these first and then I will go back over, over them. The following are those pre-assumptions and averages. The pre-assumptions. 1. That the Earth is a globe with an average radius of 3,959 miles. I don't have a problem doing that because the pole-to-pole -pole diameter of the Earth and the equatorial diameter of the Earth only vary by 26 miles. Now taking the average is less than 26 miles difference out of a diameter of nearly 8,000 miles. Before we entertain your objection to using the average radius of the Earth, I want you to explain to me how the 26 miles is going to change the resulting speed of light. Good luck to you with that. Second of all, I recently put out a video where I showed five separate ways to determine the radius of the Earth. The method of Eratosthenes, the method in the geometry of Aristarchus, great circle distances across the surface of the Earth, using the distance and the size of the Moon to calculate the radius of the Earth and the ISS and the Moon to determine the radius of the Earth. 
all of which came back to the same radius, which is the currently accepted average radius of the Earth of about 39.59. Two, that the Sun is also a sphere of a particular size and at a particular distance. Next, the Sun is a sphere of a particular size and a particular distance. Yes, that's very well established. It's been established a number of different ways. Aristarchus established it geometrically 2300 years ago. And he did it accurately, as I demonstrated the other day. When you put in modern measurements of the critical distances, you get an answer within 2 or 3% of the currently accepted value for an astronomical unit. We also had the transit of Venus in 1769 that got it within a few hundred kilometers. Currently, we know the distance from the Earth to the Moon to a matter of meters. So really, your objections to that are dismissed. We definitely know the distance from the Earth to the Sun. We definitely know the size of the Sun, and the Sun is most clearly a spherical object. We can see it when we look at sunspots during the rotation of the Sun, and that's something that any of us can do. But let's go ahead and let you continue. Three, that the Earth as a globe is orbiting around the Sun. Four, that Kepler's analema is correct and true with a question. Now, I always found number three to be an interesting question. And that is that the Earth is a globe and is orbiting around the Sun. Well, it most definitely is a globe. It measures out as a globe, and it definitely is orbiting around the Sun. How do we know that? This is a time lapse of Venus. Now, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things here. First of all, you have a very tiny Venus up here, and it's very small. And as time goes on, Venus comes around and gets closer and closer. And notice the phases of Venus. Now, Venus can also have not only a crescent phase, but it can have a new moon style phase where you can't see Venus at all. This can only occur if Venus is between us and the sun. If Venus was not between us and the sun, there would never be a time that Venus would not be visible. Now, one other hint that we have is the size of Venus. Notice that at a crescent, Venus is approximately seven times as large as it is when it gets as full as it's going to get. This is because when Venus is at a thin crescent or invisible period, it's closest to the Earth. The only way for it to even approach being full, like a full moon, is when it's on the opposite side of the Sun's orbit. This Venus is much closer to us than that Venus, and as a result, this Venus is seven times as large as that Venus is. Now this is a photograph of an actual solar analemma. Notice it's a figure of eight. You've got one loop that's large and one loop that is small. Let's go see this graphed out and we can figure out what it means. Now this is a graph of the solar analemma and as you can tell, you can see the months. This is the winter in the northern hemisphere and this is the summer. The variation from the midline is called the equation of time, and it has to do directly with our orbit around the sun. We are closer to the sun and get more variation in the winter in the northern hemisphere, and we're further away with less variation in the summer. Now, I had an entire video that just came out on my STEM channel called Slide Rules and Mathematics on the equation of time and how we use the Earth's rotation and our distance to the sun to determine time and specifically solar time. And we use both astrolabes and sundials to try and gain a better understanding of that. If you want to have more information about that, go on and have a look at those videos. The averages. One, the average radius of a globe out. Two, the average distance of a globe out from the sun over a, tw over a 12 month period. Okay, <clears throat> just quickly I'll go through them. Okay, so Brian, we're not going to let you go over them again because you had your chance to go over them the first time. But I want to close right now to talk about the difference between a theory, a hypothesis, and a convention. Theories and hypotheses are trying to explain something by proposing a mechanism for them, and then we test those mechanisms. We make predictions and we test those predictions. A convention is not a theory or a hypothesis. This is just a drawing compass right here. Now, there is an angle formed between these two points. Whether or not we describe this angle in degrees, minutes, and seconds, or decimal degrees, or radians, 
it does not change that angle. That angle is still fixed. All we're changing is the way that we describe it. Now, one other thing that I want to make a point of, it doesn't matter what angle or what plane this drawing compass is in. The angular distance between those two points is still the same. You know what else doesn't change the angular distance between these two points? Putting it up against another object. If that doesn't change the angle. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thanks for stopping by. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. I kind of like doing these down in my living room because it's a nice, comfortable way of doing it. I'll go back up into the studio here in a bit, but I thought I'd give it a little homey touch for a little while. So, see you soon. Stay healthy, folks. Bye, 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 the science guy.